and gentlemen, good evening. It is 10 minutes past seven on this, the 15th of June, 1920. Here at the New Street Works of the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company, the world famous Australian soprano, Dame Nellie Melba, will perform the first live entertainment broadcast by a professional concert artist. This broadcast is sponsored by the Daily Mail and the performance will be for one night only. There are moments in time when the future calls and there can be no going back. This is one such moment. So, dear listeners, may I present Dame Nelly Melba.
ladies and gentlemen, there will now be a three-minute intermission during which Mr. David Stanley will entertain you with melodies played upon his piano. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mrs. Sayer. It's so nice to meet you, and welcome to the museum. Can I call you Winifred? Of course you can. <laughs> Thank you so much for the car. My pleasure. I just wish we could have met you in your original concert room in the Marconi New Street factory, but it was knocked down in the 1980s. Mm, they told me. I wouldn't worry about it. It was a dreadful room. Just an old packing shed. <laughs> but it was the room in which you and the Marconi engineers made history. Yes, so they say. <laughs> but it seems like a hundred years ago, 1920 at least. So you must recognize this. Well, will you look at that? After all these years. <laughs> Amazing. You know, that is my old microphone. Yes, it is. It's the very one they built for you back in February 1920. Surely not. It was just the old telephone off Mr Ditcham's desk. In fact, not even a whole telephone. <laughs> he broke it in half, you know. <laughs> I remember he said he didn't need the earpiece. <laughs> then he built that funny wood cone from an old cigar box on his desk with some tape. <laughs> He said it was to try to focus the sound. <laughs> it smelt like cigars when I was singing. Dame Nellie Melba used the same microphone in June of the same mm. year. Look, she even signed the wood after her concert. You can still see it just here. Oh, I never signed it. Hey, if you have a pen, I could do it now. <laughs> That's a very kind offer. But I think the Oxford Museum might get a bit cross. But if it was up to me, I'd let you. Well, it's just an old telephone. It started something incredible. You were at the very beginning of an amazing story, about to make history. Oh, nonsense. I was only there for three nights. They paid us ten shillings, you know. So, you were the first lady to sing on British radio. Yes. Yes, I was. <laughs> But everyone was much more interested in Melba. I think they forgot about me. You know, 
I actually got to see Melba that night, the night she sang. <laughs> I was this close, uh, in the same room, but she just swept past me with all the important people. <laughs> she was very uh, stern. She did have a reputation for being somewhat difficult. She was bloody rude. <laughs> Excuse my friend. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. Can you tell us where it all began? Well, it began in a pub. <laughs> I used to sing with Freddie and his troupe. He had a band, you know. <laughs> Freddie and the Funyuns. <laughs> but sometimes we were called Munyuns Funyuns. <laughs> you met the famous Marconi engineers, Mr. Round and Mr. Ditcham, in a pub. Well, we didn't know they were famous, <laughs> but they looked important. Yes, they were very senior. Mr. Round was head of research. Mr. Ditcham was head of engineering. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> they were just two very cold and wet faces in a room. <laughs> Which pub was it in? Oh, well, we sang in many. I think the first time they saw us uh, was in the Wheat Sheaf on New Street. You know, now I think of it, the two Marconi engineers came to my dad's pub when we were performing. Your mum and dad ran a pub? Oh, yes. <laughs> we were singing and dancing when they came in. <laughs> we didn't pay them no mind. We had a good crowd in and we were having good fun. <laughs> when was this? Oh, uh, it would be the beginning of 1920. Cold it was, but no snow that I remember. I can see it now. <laughs> the bar was warm and smoky. <laughs> Welcome, pie gentlemen. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I haven't seen you in here before. Did you enjoy the show? Of course they did. We were magnificent, <laughs> as always. Yes. Could, I, uh, could I introduce myself, please? I'm Henry Round. Uh, I work at the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company. It's over in New Street. Hello, both. I'm Bill Ditcham, head of engineering and chief bottle washer at the same famous works. Uh, Mr. Round here is actually head of research, so he's very important work. <laughs> uh, we are doing some work with wireless equipment down at New Street, and we need some help. Well, we don't know much about wireless. But we could come down and do a show for the Marconi staff, if you like. No, no, that was our, our, our idea too, a concert. But not just for the workers, it's more... Well, it's, it's just for us. That's a bit odd. I mean, we really like an audience. Well, we would like you to come and help us with an experiment. It's a very special experiment. We were wondering if you were all perhaps free on Tuesday night next week. It, it's, it's a wireless broadcast. Sounds fun. But I'm not sure we'd like to perform with no audience at all. Well, you would have an audience. There'd be myself, Mr. Round, and um, a few colleagues. Yes, we'd, we'd like you all to come to the Marconi New Street Works, 6.30, the main entrance. I think we might have a concert booked on one of those nights. We do, like a small fee. Oh. Well, all right. How about, uh, well, how about we give you ten shillings for three nights? You'll be finished by 8pm at the latest. I'm sure you could still make your next venue. So what do you think, girl? Can we do two in one night? Sounds like fun. <laughs> what do you say, Mr Munyon? No one calls me that. Here on the stage, I'm just ready. What do you think, Treacle? Yeah, all right. <laughs> I think we should do it. <laughs> Gentlemen, you've got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Henry Joseph Round. <laughs> Captain Eckersley. The late of the Royal Engineers. Henry, good to finally make your acquaintance. Yes, of course, it could only be you. Me, you know, most people knock and wait when they arrive. Well, in fact, everybody does, but not you, I see, Captain Eckersley. Quite right. No time for knocking and waiting. Anyway, you wouldn't want to risk waking your engineers up. Important they get their beauty sleep. <laughs> so, Captain Round. Um... Well, aren't you going to say welcome to Chelmsford? Welcome to Marconi's? No. Yeah. Um, oh, I say, old man, I hear they just gave you the MC for your um, vital secret war work. Well played. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, 
I'm not stopping. I've just come to say hello. I'm actually on the scrounge for some bids. No surprise there. Yes. Then. Look, I, I bet everyone heard your wretched motorcycle coming all the way down New Street. I have warned stores to lock everything portable away. By all accounts, they ought to lock up their daughters too. The rest I'm having chained down. Yes, valves or daughters. Captain Eckersley, you might as well head straight back to your little hut in Rittle. You go and be with your manic band of pirates. Please, just leave us now, will you? An empty-handed would be best. Well, that's the spirit that won a war, old man. So, where is Uncle Bill Ditcham? Rumour is that he has some of his special MT4 valves going spare, uh, whether he knows it or not. By coincidence, my sidecar has just enough space to squeeze a few in. Uh, what? Ah, Mr Ditcham. Bill, old man, there you are. I was just coming to find you. Well, I was just trying to hide from you. Not very well, is it, Pat? No, 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 no. Well. Come on now, gentlemen. Don't be like that. We are all in the same game now. Always had a soft spot for all you ex-army chaps. Can't you take anything seriously? Do you know, they are calling it the Great War. Nothing great about it. Well, anyway, Henry, they gave you a nice medal and some cash. Uh, enough said, Peter, about Mr. Round's medal, I mean. Oh, just bloody well deserved. First rate work. Anyway, I've been exiled to an old ex army hut in the muddy field at Rittle. It's my design and research department. Big things can happen in little huts. Yes. Mm. Yes, I understand Mr. Bungay is your manager. God help him. Yes, he wrote the standard textbooks on wireless telegraphy, but uh, telephony is a whole new game. I know you and Bill have been playing with speech wireless since, what, 1914? Actually, 1904. Who counted? 1910 for me, I think. Uh, actually, uh, Henry, old man, I, I couldn't have done it without your first telephony set. There were some great ideas hidden in that little box. Just needed some special Eckersley touches. <laughs> anyway, chaps, um, yes, I, I've come to have a quiet word. I hear you are building a transmitter that will generate 15,000 watts. Now, that really is breaking all the rules. Now, personally, I love it, but actually I've come to kick and scream and, and try to get you to perhaps you know, turn it down a bit. What? Turn it down? Well, in simple terms, your speech experiments are causing all manner of problems, primarily to Croydon Airfield. This is all meant to be a private signal test for our stations. It's nothing to do with you. Understood, sir. Just a, a quiet word to the wise. The interference is annoying a lot of important people. Army, Navy, Air Force, name but three. Anyway, um, your call, of course. Right, got a dash. Good to meet you both. <laughs> Captain Eckersley drives me mad. Ah. The trouble is, he's far too clever, probably for his own good, but, you know, he could be right. No, doubtful. Hey, the, the valves that were on my bench. Eckersley's made off with them. Damn his eyes. <laughs> civilians were shot and are reported to be dead as the result of a collision between a number of civilians and a party of soldiers who, after leaving one of the theatres in Dublin, were singing God Save the King. It is still not known whether any of the soldiers were injured. So far, no other casualties have been reported. That news from Ireland concludes today's speech telephony test. This is Marconi Station MZX Chelmsford. We are now closing down. Thank you. Yes, yes, it's much better, Bill. Yes, I, I, well done. And I particularly like your pronunciation of those strange Scottish places. Oh. <laughs> no, it all sounded very good. Oh, Eckersley telephoned. He says it all comes through at Rittle very clearly. Oh, Mr. Arthur Burroughs called round. His telephone hasn't stopped ringing since I stopped reading Bradshaw's railway timetable. <laughs> Seems the radio hams like the news much better. <laughs> Remember that chaos last year when my voice went across the Atlantic from Ballybunion? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> the first to transmit a voice from the old world to the new. <laughs> yes, I, I suspect now we've started this, you know, the, the newspapers won't leave us alone. Well, don't. Let's look a gift horse in the mouth. No. Peter Eckersley will throw a purple fit if his Croydon air traffic system gets flattened again. <laughs> well, he didn't like our six kilowatts. <laughs> Fifteen kilowatts could be interesting. <laughs> 
Well, let's cross that bridge when we come to it, eh? Don't forget, we've got that singing group coming in tonight. Do you know, I, I still think we'll have real problems transmitting more than one instrument mm. at the same time. Do you think, I mean, it might be safer just to transmit the singer's voice on its own, like a cappella? Mm. Gentlemen, what a stir you've made. Did you see the crowd at the New Street Gate again, all asking when the next news transmission will be? <laughs> well done. Yeah, well, that depends on Bill's managing to buy a newspaper at the railway station. <laughs> <laughs> Is it tonight you're trying some music? We, we want to keep the interest up. Yeah, Burroughs, are you really sure this, this Freddy and his uh, bunions are, are, the, are the best people for the job? They're cheap. Three nights, ten bob. Mm. Your news transmissions have started something important, but we have to keep pushing onto new things. Yes, but are we ready? Is this really the, the thing we should be doing right now? Yes, it most definitely is. Arthur, I'll read out timetables or news as long as the Marconi stations all listen and report. But music and entertainment, surely that's the job of the vaudeville theatres. Yeah. Uh, this transmitter, well, it's just a prototype. And as for the microphone, well, let's just say this needs a lot of work. Uh, let's try some singing tonight and see how it goes. Is anybody listening to me? I tell you, we will have problems transmitting even one musical instrument. It just won't work. Mm. Well, the piano won't transmit properly. I mean, did you hear the clarinet the, or the oboe? They all make the transmitter howl. Well, we promised Burroughs a concert of some sort. We even tried a violin, and I swear it sounded like a cat being fed through the mangle. <laughs> so, are we ready? What's the news? Well, it's good news and bad news, Arthur. The good news is the transmitter is working well. And the bad news? We can't transmit music. <laughs> the microphone won't do it. No. After all, it's just a part of the telephone from my desk. Oh, so don't bother to call me. <laughs> No, it works fine with the voice. It's, uh, that's no surprise. I mean, that, that's what it's designed for. But it won't entertain anything that resembles a musical instrument. But I have the press uh, or Mr. Prime... Ditchum? Mr. Ditchum? Yes? Uh, it's me, Winifred. Winifred Thayer. Uh, we're the singers. <laughs> well, I am the singer. My dear, hello again. Welcome to Marconi's New Street Works. Oh, may I introduce Mr. Arthur Burroughs' yeah. publicity? And, of course, you've met Captain Henry Round Research. Evening all. Hi, Winnie. Right then, what's all this about, this uh, radio lark? Is it the same stuff as I heard in the trenches? Well, it, it, well more or less. It's just a, a lot more power. That's right. Tonight, we are going to send the sound of your voices and hopefully even your instruments into the air by the means of the transmitter. Well, how far can it go? Well, that's a really good question that we're... We're trying to discover tonight. We're also trying to work out if we can actually transmit a singing voice and then try out various instruments. Mm, we did a short experiment this afternoon and it didn't work very well. No. We've asked all our stations all over the world to listen tonight and for the next two nights and they'll tell us by telegram if they hear us, well, you, and how good and clear that signal was. Tonight, well, it's, it's purely an experiment. We want to calmly broadcast to many hundreds of people. Over the past few weeks, we've been doing some testing with Mr. Ditchen talking and reading the news, but see, neither of us can sing or play. So it's time to bring in the professionals, well, so to speak. Why, thank you, kind sir. Uh, did you say hundreds? Well, that's a lot of people. We only get 40 at best at the wheat sheaf. Uh, something about the hum, by the way. That is the generator next door. Mm. Now, after a while, you won't notice it. Anyway, this transmitter will turn your voice into radio waves. Now, you will be singing from here, and tonight, with a bit of luck, we are going to make a little bit of history. Yeah, Mr. Munyon, tonight, I'm, I'm afraid, we will only be transmitting the singer, and, and you and your band, though, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to watch. Yeah, we will still get paid, won't we? Yes, yes, of course. Now, Miss Sayer, I do apologize for the surroundings. Now, if you could just step a little closer to the microphone, and when you're ready, give us some notes at the level you would normally sing. Sometimes No, wait, sorry, sorry, wait, wait. No, just w wait until I tell you. <clears throat> Don't worry now. <laughs> just sing anything you're comfortable with. Uh, a nice long trill would be good. 
Oh. Yes, that's very good. That's Miss Say. That's very good. Please, please keep singing. Sing some other notes for me. Oh. Good. Clear and no distortion. The meters are perfect to transmit a like, sir. So, let's go with it. Well, that's very good. Well done. You right. really are. You've done this before. Okay, so, go quiet, everyone, please. And let me say, if, it, it seems that the transmitter really likes your voice. We're making history tonight. February the 23rd, 1920. Okay, we'll go on air. It is at the 8 p.m. Don't look so worried, Miss Sayer. I'll be here right beside you. <laughs> right, please, please, everybody, please, no coughing, no sneezing, no snorting, and definitely no comments, right, of any kind, no talking of any kind. Anybody got any questions? No? Very good. And let's begin. Hello. This is Marconi, station MZX Chelmsford calling. This evening, for a change, we have a vocalist. Our first vocalist. A lady vocalist, too. You'll be glad to know. So, I will now ask Miss Winifred Sayer to start with her first song, Absent, by John W. Metcalf. Sometimes between long shadows on the grass The little truant waves of sunlight pass My eyes grow dim with tenderness a while Thinking I see thee Thinking I see Sometimes in the twilight gloom apart The tall tree whispers, whispers heart to heart Oh, my poor lips are eager, answers all Thinking I hear thee, thinking I hear thee <laughs> well, Miss Sayer, oh, it all went very well. I mean, all three nice. So the testing's finished? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, a lot of Marconi land stations heard you very clearly. <laughs> they heard you in Ghent and in Lisbon and Norway, Alex. <laughs> well done. Oh. My father didn't believe me when I described this place. Stop, he said, <laughs> <laughs> singing into a bit of an old telephone in a packing shed. <laughs> Ah, Mr. Ditchum, I was just telling our young star here what a very good impression she made. The first lady to sing on British wireless. Thank you both so much for this. Well, apparently Lord Northcliffe from the Daily Mail newspaper wants a concert now. From me? Uh, no, lass, not this time. Uh, Lord Northcliffe wants his own special concert for his Daily Mail newspaper. He's offering to pay the entire bill and has already booked the illustrious Madam Dame Nellie Melba to grace us with her presence. When? Ah, the 15th of June this year, 1920. I know what year it is. Just Burroughs. Uh, apparently the old boy's beside himself with excitement. Melba, really? I can't believe it. Coming here in June. Oh, so, less than two months to organise it. Well, new transmitter, new audio, new studio, and one more step for Burroughs towards his... British Broadcasting System. Well, I don't know what time it's supposed to, it's supposed to be here. Well, the train was due at 5.15 p.m. Burroughs had it all planned out. They were driving around the block first. Oh, that the car? Oh, here they come now. Oh, good. No, she's coming. Oh, give me strength. She's driven past. I mean, what is the driver thinking of? 
What's a bit? The crowds are certainly out to see her. Hear that? They're taking her around the town one more time in the Rolls Royce. Well, the Daily Mail is paying her £1,000. They probably want their money's worth. <laughs> yes, they want a good story. Think of the front page tomorrow. Great future for wireless concerts. Well, these are coming the car's coming back. Oh. They are. Look at that crowd. Wow. Oh. Get ready, gentlemen. How wonderful you're here, Madam Melba. Is this it? Yes, this is Marconi Station, MZX Chelmsford. We are delighted to welcome you here tonight, ma'am. Well, I ask you. <laughs> Just where am I meant to perform? Uh, well, you were going to sing in the director's dining room, but uh, this afternoon we had a bit of a technical hitch, so tonight we are going to ask you to join us here in our temporary room next to the transmitters. Whatever is best for my voice. How do you intend to transmit my voice? I've already told you it's not the subject for experimentation by your young magic play boxes. Uh, no, no, your voice will be sent in perfect clarity, unchanged out into the ether. Uh, can I introduce you to our head of research, Captain Round, and uh, ask him to explain? Yes. Uh, welcome to the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company. Uh, you saw the giant masts outside in your car, ma'am. Well, they're very tall. They're nearly 450 feet high. From the top of those masts, your voice will be radiated all over the world. Young man, if you think I am climbing up there, you are very sadly mistaken. I am Melba. Where's my coat? No, sorry. No, I, I do apologize. No, I meant to say that the... The signal will be transmitted from those huge masts outside. You will sing in this room. Your voice will travel through the air and be heard by thousands and thousands of people. Uh, thousands? Um, here, Mum, you, uh, you sing into here. But this is just an old hat stand, and not a very good one at that. It's just a piece of broken telephone, if I'm not very much mistaken. And please get rid of this carpet, it's dreadful. Yeah, yeah, can I uh, introduce you to Mr. Ditcham, Head of Engineering? Uh, very pleased to meet you. Uh, this is the transmitter, ma'am. <laughs> it will turn your voice into sound waves. Uh, people all round this country will be listening in. People everywhere in the world. That is the magic of wireless. Well, well, um, can we please have a test note, ma'am? Uh, Madam Melba, uh, could I ask you to stand just a bit closer to the microphone? Thank you. Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I, is that work? very good. Yes, yes, good Lord, oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, that'll go very well. No, Thank you. Go. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, quiet, everyone, please. Uh, right, Ma Madam Melba, we'll begin in a in a few seconds. So, ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, everybody ready? Uh, four, three, two, silence. Hello, this is the Marconi Wireless Company in Chelmsford, England. Station MZX calling. Tonight, Dame Nellie Melba, the world famous opera prima donna, is going to sing for you. First in English, then Italian. You will be listening to her sing on the wireless for the very first time ever. I apologize that we don't have any control over the atmosphere, but wherever you are, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dame Nellie Melba. <laughs> Stop transmitting. Oh, no. Uh, uh, give me a moment. I'll check the uh, valves. Uh, 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 one of these, I'm sure. I did check them beforehand, but... Uh, I've changed a valve. Excellent. Uh, Madam Melba, uh, please, the, the world is calling for more. Are they? Shall I go on singing? Please. Oh, what a relief. 
Gentlemen, a toast Aye. to the Melba concert. Yeah. Mm. How far did the signals reach? Do we know? Oh, yes. Melba was heard all over Europe and in Iran and Iraq and America. <laughs> Even Basil Fisk in Australia heard as well, more or less. I think this is the start of something really big. Yeah, did we wake up our American cousins? <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> Apparently, all over there, their wireless has been descended into complete chaos. <laughs> well, someone needs to show America how it's done. That was probably the largest wireless signal I have ever encountered. We were rather loud. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that in southern France, windows rattled and pigeons fell from the sky. <laughs> Nothing could safely fly. When Melbourne was on air, you grounded every flight in Europe. <laughs> Actually, it's the same whenever you chaps turn your big station on. No, oh, everybody mm. wants to perform on the wireless. A national broadcasting service is just around the corner. Any day now, Mark my words. They've closed us down. It's all over. I, I just can't believe it. The Postmaster General, the MP, the Right Honourable F.G. Kellaway, he, he has closed our Chelmsford station down. No more concerts, no news, not even a railway timetable. Kellaway says it's got to stop. We are interfering with legitimate services. Peter, and I have some news. Ah, that doesn't bode well, Burroughs. So, who is cross with me now? No one this time. It's been decided that you and your airborne wireless team here will be organising the first regular British radio broadcast station. It will have an official license, schedule, advertising, everything. But are you serious? Deadly serious. <laughs> but Arthur, that's always been Chelmsford's job. Oh, since Chelmsford went off air, the radio amateurs campaigned and generally made a nuisance of themselves at the very highest level. Well, they've actually won. They have finally got their new broadcast station. No more one-off concerts, no more experimental equipment and temporary call signs. This is a bit of history in the making. And we are giving it to you. Now is the time. The time for British broadcasting. Well, so what do you want us to do? <laughs> I want you to do whatever it takes. Who knows where this can go? This is an amazing opportunity. Well, sounds more like an order, old chap. I tell you, if you broadcast, the people will listen. Look, all you riddle chaps really have to do is just light the valves. I'll handle the PR and all the content. It's a piece of cake. Yeah, come on, give me that paper, Arthur. Let me have a look. <coughs> uh, hell's teeth. What? You want it by when? February the 14th? It's St. Valentine's Day. Yes. What? Are you mad, man? That's less than two weeks away. I'm sorry, but that's the date the license starts. The advertising press release has already gone out. We, you, have to be ready. I really don't care how you do it. Just make it happen.
Winifred, after all this time, looking back over all the years, what did you think of it all? Oh, well, I remember it was very cold. <laughs> it was February, after all. Thinking about it all tonight, you know, I thought the whole affair was a bit of a Punch and Judy show. <laughs> and my daddy thought we were all mad. I can't believe it all started in Chelmsford. But look where we are now. Worldwide broadcasting manufacturing huge industries. The BBC. You were the first singer behind the microphone. And there were many after me. But Winifred, you were the first. Thank you. 